2001, a space odyssey. Forward. Behind every man now alive stand 30 ghosts, for that is the ratio by which the dead outnumber the living. Since the dawn of time, roughly a hundred billion human beings have walked the planet Earth. Now this is an interesting number, for by a curious coincidence there are approximately a hundred billion stars in our local universe, the Milky Way. So for every man who has ever lived in this universe, there shines a star. But every one of those stars is a sun, often far more brilliant and glorious than the small, nearby star we call the sun. And many, perhaps most, of those alien suns have planets circling them. So almost certainly there is enough land in the sky to give every member of the human species back to the first ape man his own private, world-sized heaven or hell. How many of those potential heavens and hells are now inhabited, and by what manner of creatures, we have no way of guessing. The very nearest is a million times farther away than Mars or Venus, those still remote goals of the next generation. But the barriers of distance are crumbling. One day we shall meet our equals, or our masters, among the stars. Men have been slow to face this prospect. Some still hope that it may never become reality. Increasing numbers, however, are asking, why have such meetings not occurred already, since we ourselves are about to venture into space? Why not indeed? Here is one possible answer to that very reasonable question. But please remember, this is only a work of fiction. The truth, as always, will be far stranger. Arthur C. Clarke Chapter 1 The Road to Extinction The drought had lasted now for ten million years, and the reign of the terrible lizards had long since ended. Here on the equator, in the continent which would one day be known as Africa, the battle for existence had reached a new climax of ferocity, and the victor was not yet in sight. In this barren and desiccated land only the small, or the swift, or the fierce could flourish, or even hope to survive. The man-apes of the veldt were none of these things, and they were not flourishing. Indeed, they were already far down the road to racial extinction. About fifty of them occupied a group of caves overlooking a small, parched valley which was divided by a sluggish stream fed from snows in the mountains 200 miles to the north. In bad times, the stream vanished completely, and the tribe lived in the shadow of thirst. It was always hungry, and now it was starving. When the first faint glow of dawn crept into the cave, Moon Watcher saw that his father had died in the night. He did not know that the old one was his father, for such a relationship was utterly beyond his understanding, but as he looked at the emaciated body, he felt a dim disquiet that was the ancestor of sadness. The two babies were already whimpering for food, but became silent when Moon Watcher snarled at them. One of the mothers, defending the infant she could not properly feed, gave him an angry growl in return. He lacked the energy even to cuff her for her presumption. Now it was light enough to leave. Moon Watcher picked up the shriveled corpse and dragged it after him as he bent under the low overhang of the cave. Once outside, he threw the body over his shoulder and stood upright, the only animal in all this world able to do so. Among his kind, Moon Watcher was almost a giant. He was nearly five feet high, and though badly undernourished, weighed over a hundred pounds. His hairy, muscular body was halfway between ape and man but his head was already much nearer to man than ape. The forehead was low, and there were ridges over the eye sockets, yet he unmistakably held in his genes the promise of humanity. As he looked out upon the hostile world of the Pleistocene, there was already something in his gaze beyond the capacity of any ape. In those dark, deep-set eyes was a dawning awareness the first intimations of an intelligence that could not possibly fulfill itself for ages yet and might soon be extinguished forever. There was no sign of danger, so Moon Watcher began to scramble down the almost vertical slope outside the cave, only slightly hindered by his burden. As if they had been waiting for his signal, 
the rest of the tribe emerged from their own homes farther down the rock face and began to hasten toward the muddy waters of the stream for their morning drink. Moonwatcher looked across the valley to see if the others were in sight, but there was no trace of them. Perhaps they had not yet left their caves, or were already foraging farther along the hillside. Since they were nowhere to be seen, Moonwatcher forgot them. He was incapable of worrying about more than one thing at a time. First, he must get rid of the old one. But this was a problem that demanded little thought. There had been many deaths this season, one of them in his own cave. He had only to put the corpse where he had left the new baby at the last quarter of the moon, and the hyenas would do the rest. They were already waiting, where the little valley fanned out into the savannah, almost as if they had known that he was coming. Moonwatcher left the body under a small bush. All the earlier bones were already gone, and hurried back to rejoin the tribe. He never thought of his father again. His two mates, the adults from the other caves, and most of the youngsters, were foraging among the drought-stunted trees farther up the valley, looking for berries, succulent roots and leaves, and occasional windfalls like small lizards or rodents. Only the babies and the feeblest of the old folk were left in the caves. If there was any surplus food at the end of the day searching, they might be fed. If not, the hyenas would soon be in luck once more. But this day was a good one. Though as Moonwatcher had no real remembrance of the past, he could not compare one time with another. He had found a hive of bees in the stump of a dead tree, and so had enjoyed the finest delicacy that his people could ever know. He still licked his fingers from time to time as he led the group homeward in the late afternoon. Of course, he had also collected a fair number of stains, but he had scarcely noticed them. He was now as near to contentment as he was ever likely to be, for though he was still hungry, he was not actually weak with hunger. That was the most to which any man ate could ever aspire. His contentment vanished when he reached the stream. The others were there. They were there every day, but that did not make it any the less annoying. There were about thirty of them, and they could not have been distinguished from the members of Moonwatcher's own tribe. As they saw him coming, they began to dance, shake their arms, and shriek on their side of the stream, and his own people replied in kind. And that was all that happened. Though the man apes often fought and wrestled one another, their disputes very seldom resulted in serious injuries. Having no claws or fighting canine teeth, and being well protected by hair, they could not inflict much harm on one another. In any event, they had little surplus energy for such unproductive behavior. Snarling and threatening was a much more efficient way of asserting their points of view. The confrontation lasted about five minutes, then the display died out as quickly as it had begun, and everyone drank his fill of the muddy water. Honor had been satisfied. Each group had staked its claim to its own territory. This important business having been settled, the tribe moved off along its side of the river. The nearest worthwhile grazing was now more than a mile from the caves, and they had to share it with a herd of large, antelope-like beasts who barely tolerated their presence. They could not be driven away, for they were armed with ferocious daggers on their foreheads, the natural weapons which the man-apes did not possess. So Moonwatcher and his companions chewed berries and fruit and leaves and fought off the pangs of hunger, while all around them, competing for the same fodder, was a potential source of more food than they could ever hope to eat. Yet the thousands of tons of succulent meat roaming over the savannah and through the bush was not only beyond their reach, it was beyond their imagination. In the midst of plenty, they were slowly starving to death. The tribe returned to its cave without incident in the last light of the day. The injured female who had remained behind cooed with pleasure as Moonwatcher gave her the berry-covered branch he had brought back and began to attack it ravenously. There was little enough nourishment here, but it would help her to survive until the wound the leopard had given her had healed and she could forage for herself again. Over the valley a full moon was rising and a chill wind was blowing down from the distant mountains. It would be very cold tonight, but cold, like hunger, was not a matter for any real concern. It was merely part of the background of life. 
Moon Watcher barely stirred when the shrieks and screams echoed up the slope from one of the lower caves, and he did not need to hear the occasional growl of the leopard to know exactly what was happening. Down there in the darkness, old white hair and his family were fighting and dying, and the thought that he might help in some way never crossed Moon Watcher's mind. The harsh logic of survival ruled out such fancies, and not a voice was raised in protest from the listening hillside. Every cave was silent, lest it also attract disaster. The tumult died away, and presently Moon Watcher could hear the sound of a body being dragged over rocks. That lasted only a few seconds, then the leopard that it could hold on its kill. It made no further noise as it padded silently away, carrying its victim effortlessly in its jaws. For a day or two, there would be no further danger here, but there might be other enemies abroad, taking advantage of this cold little sun that shone only by night. If there was sufficient warning, the smaller predators could sometimes be scared away by shouts and screams. Moon Watcher crawled out of the cave, clambered onto a large boulder beside the entrance, and squatted there to survey the valley. Of all the creatures who had yet walked on Earth, the man-apes were the first to look steadfastly at the moon. And though he could not remember it, when he was very young, Moon Watcher would sometimes reach out and try to touch that ghostly face rising above the hills. He had never succeeded, and now he was old enough to understand why. For first, of course, he must find a high enough tree to climb. Sometimes he watched the valley, and sometimes he watched the moon, but always he listened. Once or twice he dozed off, but he slept with a hair-trigger alertness, and the slightest sound would have disturbed him. At a great age of twenty-five, he was still in full possession of all his faculties. It his luck continued, and he avoided accidents, disease, predators, and starvation. He might survive for as much as another ten years. The night wore on, cold and clear, without further alarms, and the moon rose slowly amid equatorial constellations that no human eye would ever see. In the caves, between spells of fitful dozing and fearful waiting, were being born the nightmares of generations yet to be. And twice there passed slowly across the sky, rising up to the zenith and descending into the east, a dazzling point of light, more brilliant than any star. Chapter 2 The New Rock Late that night, Moon Watcher suddenly awoke. Tired out by the day's exertions and disasters, he had been sleeping more soundly than usual, yet he was instantly alert at the first faint scrabbling down in the valley. He sat up in the fetid darkness of the cave, straining his senses out into the night, and fear crept slowly into his soul. Never in his life, already twice as long as most members of his species could expect, had he heard a sound like this. The great cats approached in silence, and the only thing that betrayed them was a rare slide of earth or the occasional cracking of a twig, yet this was a continuous crunching noise that grew steadily louder. It seemed that some enormous beast was moving through the night, making no attempt at concealment and ignoring all obstacles. Once Moonwater heard the unmistakable sound of a bush being uprooted. The elephants and Dinotheria did this often enough, but otherwise they moved as silently as the cats. And then there came a sound which Moon Watcher could not possibly have identified, for it had never been heard before in the history of the world. It was the clank of metal upon stone. Moon Watcher came face to face with the new rock when he led the tribe down to the river in the first light of morning. He had almost forgotten the terrors of the night because nothing had happened after that initial noise so he did not even associate this strange thing with danger or with fear. There was, after all, nothing in the least alarming about it. It was a rectangular slab, three times his height, but narrow enough to span with his arms, and it was made of some completely transparent material. 
Indeed, it was not easy to see except when the rising sun glinted on its edges, as Moon Watcher had never encountered ice or even crystal clear water. There were no natural objects to which he could compare this apparition. It was certainly rather attractive, and though he was wisely cautious of most new things, he did not hesitate for long before sidling up to it. As nothing happened, he put out his hand and felt a cold, hard surface. After several minutes of intense thought, he arrived at a brilliant explanation. It was a rock, of course and it must have grown during the night. There were many plants that did this, white, pulpy things shaped like pebbles that seemed to shoot up during the hours of darkness. It was true that they were small and round, whereas this was large and sharp-edged, but greater and later philosophers than Moon Watcher would be prepared to overlook equally striking exceptions to their theories. This really superb, piece of abstract thinking led Moon Watcher, after only three or four minutes, to a deduction which he immediately put to the test. The white, round pebble plants were very tasty, though there were a few that produced violent illness. Perhaps this tall one? A few licks and attempted nibbles quickly disillusioned him. There was no nourishment here. So, like a sensible man-ape, he continued on his way to the river and forgot all about the crystalline monolith during the daily routine of shrieking at the others. The foraging today was very bad, and the tribe had to travel several miles from the caves to find any food at all. During the merciless heat of noon, one of the frailer females collapsed, far from any possible shelter. Her companions gathered round her, twittering and meeping sympathetically, but there was nothing that anyone could do. If they had been less exhausted, they might have carried her with them. But there was no surplus energy for such acts of kindness. She had to be left behind to recover or not with her own resources. They passed the spot in the homeward track that evening. There was not a bone to be seen. In the last light of day, looking round anxiously for early hunters, they drank hastily at the stream and started to climb up to their caves. They were still a hundred yards from the new rock when the sound began. It was barely audible, yet it stopped them dead, so that they stood paralyzed on the trail with their jaws hanging slackly. A simple, maddeningly repetitious vibration, it pulsed out from the crystal and hypnotized all who came within its spell, for the first time and the last for three million years. The sound of drumming was heard in Africa. The throbbing grew louder, more insistent. Presently, the man-apes began to move forward like sleepwalkers toward the source of that compulsive sound. Sometimes they took little dancing steps as their blood responded to rhythms that their descendants would not create for ages yet. Totally entranced, they gathered round the monolith, forgetting the hardships of the day, the perils of the approaching dusk, and the hunger in their bellies. The drumming became louder, the night darker, and as the shadows lengthened and the light drained from the sky, the crystal began to glow. First, it lost its transparency and became suffused with a pale, milky luminescence, tantalizing, ill-defined phantoms moved across its surface and in its depths. They coalesced into bars of light and shadow, then formed intermeshing, spoked patterns that began slowly to rotate. Faster and faster spun the wheels of light, and the throbbing of the drums accelerated with them. Now, utterly hypnotized, the man-apes could only stare slack-jawed into this astonishing display of pyrotechnics. They had already forgotten the instincts of their forefathers and the lessons of a lifetime. Not one of them ordinarily would have been so far from his cave so late in the evening, for the surrounding brush was full of frozen shapes and staring eyes as the creatures of the night suspended their business to see what would happen next. Now, the spinning wheels of light began to merge and the spokes fused into luminous bars that slowly receded into the distance, rotating on their axes as they did so. They split into pairs, 
and the resulting sets of lines started to oscillate across one another, slowly changing their angles of intersection. Fantastic, fleeting geometrical patterns flickered in and out of existence as the glowing grids meshed and unmeshed, and the man-apes watched, mesmerized captives of the shining crystal. They could never guess that their minds were being probed, their bodies mapped, their reactions studied, the potentials evaluated. At first, the whole tribe remained half-crouching in a motionless tableau, as if frozen into stone. Then, the man-ape nearest to the slab suddenly came to life. He did not move from his position, but his body lost its trance-like rigidity and became animated as if it were a puppet controlled by invisible strings. The head turned this way and that. The mouth silently opened and closed. The hands clenched and unclenched. Then he bent down, snapped off a long stalk of grass, and attempted to tie it into a knot with clumsy fingers. He seemed to be a thing possessed, struggling against some spirit or demon who had taken over control of his body. He was panting for breath and his eyes were full of terror as he tried to force his fingers to make movements more complex than any that they had ever attempted before. Despite all his efforts, he succeeded only in breaking the stalk into pieces. As the fragments fell to the ground, the controlling influence left him and he froze once more into immobility. Another man-ape came to life and went through the same routine. This was a younger, more adaptable specimen. It succeeded where the older one had failed. On the planet Earth, the first crude knot had been tied. Others did stranger and still more pointless things. Some held their hands out at arm's length and tried to touch their fingertips together, first with both eyes open, then with one closed. Some were made to stare at ruled patterns in the crystal, which became more and more finely divided until the lines had merged into a gray blur, and all heard single, pure sounds of varying pitch that swiftly sank below the level of hearing. When Moonwatch's turn came, he felt very little fear. His main sensation was a dull resentment as his muscles twitched and his limbs moved at commands that were not wholly his own. Without knowing why, he bent down and picked up a small stone. When he straightened up, he saw that there was a new image in the crystal slab. The grids and the moving, dancing patterns had gone. Instead, there was a series of concentric circles surrounding a small black disk. Obeying the silent orders in his brain, he pitched the stone with a clumsy, overarm throw. It missed the target by several feet. Try again, said the command. He searched around until he had found another pebble. This time it hit the slab with a ringing, bell-like tone. He was still a long way off, but his aim was improving. At the fourth attempt, he was only inches from the central bullseye. A feeling of indescribable pleasure, almost sexual in its intensity, flooded his mind. Then the control relaxed. He felt no impulse to do anything except to stand and wait. One by one, every member of the tribe was briefly possessed. Some succeeded, but most failed at the tasks they had been set, and all were appropriately rewarded by spasms of pleasure or of pain. Now, there was only a uniform, featureless glow in the great slab, so that it stood like a block of light superimposed on the surrounding darkness. As if waking from a sleep, the man-apes shook their heads and presently began to move along the trail to their place of shelter. They did not look back or wonder at the strange light that was guiding them to their homes and to a future unknown as yet even to the stars. Chapter 3 Academy Moonwatcher and his companions had no recollection of what they had seen after the crystal had ceased to cast its hypnotic spell over their minds and to experiment with their bodies. 
The next day, as they went out to forage, they passed it with scarcely a second thought. It was now part of the disregarded background of their lives. They could not eat it, and it could not eat them. Therefore, it was not important. Down at the river, the others made their usual ineffectual threats. Their leader, a one-eared man-ape of Moonwatcher's size and age, but in poorer condition, even made a brief foray toward the tribe's territory, screaming loudly and waving his arms in an attempt to scare the opposition and to bolster his own courage. The water of the stream was nowhere more than a foot deep, but the farther one ear moved out into it, the more uncertain and unhappy he became. Very soon he slowed to a halt, and then moved back with exaggerated dignity to join his companions. Otherwise, there was no change in the normal routine. The tribe gathered just enough nourishment to survive for another day, and no one died. And that night, the crystal slab was still waiting, surrounded by its pulsing aura of light and sound. The program it had contrived, however, was now subtly different. Some of the man-apes it ignored completely, as if it was concentrating on the most promising subjects. One of them was Moonwatcher. Once again, he felt inquisitive tendrils creeping down the unused byways of his brain. And presently, he began to see visions. They might have been within the crystal block. They might have been wholly inside his mind. In any event, to Moonwatcher, they were completely real. Yet somehow, the usual automatic impulse to drive off invaders of his territory had been lulled into quiescence. He was looking at a peaceful family group, differing in only one respect from the scenes he knew, the male, female, and two infants that had mysteriously appeared before him, were gorged and replete with sleek and glossy pelts, and this was a condition of life that Moon Watcher had never imagined. Unconsciously, he felt his own protruding ribs. The ribs of these creatures were hidden in rows of fat. From time to time they stirred lazily as they lolled at ease near the entrance of a cave, apparently at peace with the world. Occasionally, the big male emitted a monumental burp of contentment. There was no other activity, and after five minutes the scene suddenly faded out. The crystal was no more than a glimmering outline in the darkness. Moonwatcher shook himself as if awakening from a dream, abruptly realized where he was, and led the tribe back to the caves. He had no conscious memory of what he had seen, but that night, as he sat brooding at the entrance of his lair, his ears attuned to the noises of the world around him, Moonwatcher felt the first faint twinges of a new and potent emotion. It was a vague and diffuse sense of envy of dissatisfaction with his life. He had no idea of its cause, still less of its cure, but discontent had come into his soul, and he had taken one small step toward humanity. Night after night, the spectacle of those four plump man-apes was repeated until it had become a source of fascinated exasperation, serving to increase Moonwatcher's eternal, gnawing hunger. The evidence of his eyes could not have produced this effect. It needed psychological reinforcement. There were gaps in Moonwatcher's life now that he would never remember, when the very atoms of his simple brain were being twisted into new patterns. If he survived, those patterns would become eternal for his genes would pass them on to future generations. It was a slow, tedious business, but the crystal monolith was patient. Neither it nor its replicas scattered across half the globe expected to succeed with all the scores of groups involved in the experiment. A hundred failures would not matter when a single success would change the destiny of the world. By the time of the next new moon, the tribe had seen one birth and two deaths. One of these had been due to starvation. The other had occurred during the nightly ritual, 
when a man ape had suddenly collapsed while attempting to tap two pieces of stone delicately together. At once, the crystal had darkened and the tribe had been released from the spell, but the fallen man-ape had not moved and by the morning, of course, the body was gone. There had been no performance the next night. The crystal was still analyzing its mistake. The tribe streamed past it through the gathering dusk, ignoring its presence completely. The night after, it was ready for them again. The four plump man-apes were still there, and now they were doing extraordinary things. Moonwatcher began to tremble uncontrollably. He felt as if his brain would burst and wanted to turn away his eyes, but that remorseless mental control would not relax its grip. He was compelled to follow the lesson to the end, though all his instincts revolted against it. Those instincts had served his ancestors well in the days of warm rains and lush fertility, when food was to be had everywhere for the plucking. Now, times had changed, and the inherited wisdom of the past had become folly. The man-apes must adapt, or they must die, like the greater beasts who had gone before them, and whose bones now lay sealed within the limestone hills. So Moon Watcher stared at the crystal monolith with unblinking eyes, while his brain lay open to its still uncertain manipulations. Often he felt nausea, but always he felt hunger, and from time to time his hands clenched unconsciously in the patterns that would determine his new way of life. As the line of warthogs moved, snuffling and grunting across the trail, Moonwatcher came to a sudden halt. Pigs and man-apes had always ignored each other, for there was no conflict of interest between them. Like most animals that did not compete for the same food, they merely kept out of each other's way. Yet now, Moonwatcher stood, looking at them, wavering back and forth uncertainly as he was buffeted by impulses which he could not understand. Then, as if in a dream, he started searching the ground, though for what he could not have explained, even if he had had the power of speech, he would recognize it when he saw it. It was a heavy, pointed stone about six inches long, and though it did not fit his hand perfectly, it would do. As he swung his hand around, puzzled, by its suddenly increased weight, he felt a pleasing sense of power and authority. He started to move toward the nearest pig. It was a young and foolish animal, even by the undemanding standards of warthog intelligence. Though it observed him out of the corner of its eye, it did not take him seriously until much too late. Why should it suspect these harmless creatures of any evil intent? It went on rooting up the grass until Moonwatcher's stone hammer obliterated its dim consciousness. The remainder of the herd continued grazing unalarmed, for the murder had been swift and silent. All the other man-apes in the group had stopped to watch, and now they crowded round Moonwatcher and his victim with admiring wonder. Presently, one of them picked up the blood-stained weapon and began to pound the dead pig. Others joined in with any sticks and stones that they could gather until their target began a messy disintegration. Then they became bored. Some wandered off while others stood hesitantly around the unrecognizable corpse, the future of a world waiting upon their decision. It was a surprisingly long time before one of the nursing females began to lick the gory stone she was holding in her paws. And it was longer still before Moonwatcher, despite all that he had been shown, really understood that he need never be hungry again. Chapter 4 The Leopard The tools they had been programmed to use were simple enough yet they could change this world and make the man-apes its masters. The most primitive was the handheld stone that multiplied many-fold the power of a blow. 
then there was the bone club that lengthened the reach and could provide a buffer against the fangs or claws of angry animals. With these weapons, the limitless food that roamed the savannas was theirs to take. But they needed other aids, for their teeth and nails could not readily dismember anything larger than a rabbit. Luckily, nature had provided the perfect tools, requiring only the wit to pick them up. First, there was a crude but very efficient knife or saw of a model that would serve well for the next three million years. It was simply the lower jawbone of an antelope with the teeth still in place. There would be no substantial improvement until the coming of steel. Then there was an awl or dagger in the form of a gazelle horn and finally a scraping tool made from the complete jaw of almost any small animal. The stone cub, the toothed saw, the horn dagger, the bone scraper, these were the marvelous inventions which the man-apes needed in order to survive. Soon they would recognize them for the symbols of power that they were, but many months must pass before their clumsy fingers had acquired the skill or the will to use them. Perhaps, given time, they might by their own efforts have come to the awesome and brilliant concept of using natural weapons as artificial tools. But the odds were all against them, and even now there were endless opportunities for failure in the ages that lay ahead. The man-apes had been given their first chance. There would be no second one. The future was very literally in their own hands. Moons waxed and waned, babies were born and sometimes lived. Feeble, toothless thirty-year-olds died. The leopard took its toll in the night. The others threatened daily across the river, and the tribe prospered. In the course of a single year, Moonwatcher and his companions had changed almost beyond recognition. They had learned their lessons well. Now they could handle all the tools that had been revealed to them. The very memory of hunger was fading from their minds, and though the warthogs were becoming shy, there were gazelles and antelopes and zebras in countless thousands on the plains. All these animals and others had fallen prey to the apprentice hunters. Now that they were no longer half numbed with starvation, they had time both for leisure and for the first rudiments of thought. Their new way of life was now casually accepted, and they did not associate it in any way with the monolith still standing beside the trail to the river. If they had ever stopped to consider the matter, they might have boasted that they had brought about their improved status by their own efforts. In fact, they had already forgotten any other mode of existence. But no utopia is perfect. And this one had two blemishes. The first was the marauding leopard, whose passion for man-apes seemed to have grown even stronger now that they were better nourished. The second was the tribe across the river, for somehow the others had survived and had stubbornly refused to die of starvation. The leopard problem was resolved partly by chance, partly owing to a serious, indeed, almost fatal error on Moonwatcher's part. Yet at the time, his idea had seemed such a brilliant one that he had danced with joy and perhaps he could hardly be blamed for overlooking the consequences. The tribe still experienced occasional bad days, though these no longer threatened its very survival. Toward dusk, it had failed to make a kill. The home caves were already in sight as Moonwatcher led his tired and disgruntled companions back to shelter, and there, on the very threshold, they found one of nature's rare bonanzas. A full-grown antelope was lying by the trail. Its foreleg was broken, but it still had plenty of fight in it, and the circling jackals gave its dagger-like horns a respectful birth. They could afford to wait. They knew that they had only to buy their time but they had forgotten about the competition and retreated with angry snarls when the man-apes arrived. They too circled warily, keeping beyond the range of those dangerous horns, 
Then they moved to the attack with clubs and stones. It was not a very effective or coordinated attack. By the time the wretched beast had been given its quietus, the light had almost gone, and the jackals were regaining their courage. Moon Watcher, torn between fear and hunger, slowly realized that all this effort might have been in vain. It was too dangerous to stay here any longer. Then, not for the first or the last time, he proved himself a genius. With an immense effort of imagination, he visualized the dead antelope in the safety of his own cave. He began to drag it toward the cliff face. Presently, the others understood his intentions and began to help him. If he had known how difficult the task would be, he would never have attempted it. Only his great strength and the agility inherited from his arboreal ancestors allowed him to haul the carcass up the steep slope. Several times, weeping with frustration, he almost abandoned his prize, but a stubbornness as deep-seated as his hunger drove him on. Sometimes the others helped him, sometimes they hindered, more often they merely got in the way, but finally it was done. The battered antelope was dragged over the lip of the cave as the last hues of sunlight faded from the sky and the feasting began. Hours later, gorged to repletion, Moon Watcher awoke. Not knowing why, he sat up in the darkness among the sprawled bodies of his equally satiated companions and strained his ears into the night. There was no sound, except the heavy breathing around him. The whole world seemed asleep. The rocks beyond the mouth of the cave were pale as bone in the brilliant light from the moon now high overhead. Any thought of danger seemed infinitely remote. Then, from a long way off, came the sound of a falling pebble. Fearful, yet inquisitive, Moon Watcher crawled out onto the edge of the cave and peered down the face of the cliff. What he saw left him so paralyzed with fright that for long seconds he was unable to move. Only twenty feet below, two gleaming golden eyes were staring straight up at him. They held him so hypnotized with fear that he was scarcely aware of the lithe, streaked body behind them, flowing smoothly and silently from rock to rock. Never before had the lever climbed so high. It had ignored the lower caves, though it must have been well aware of their inhabitants. Now it was after other game. It was following the spore of blood up the moon-washed face of the cliff. Seconds later, the night was made hideous by the shrieks of alarm from the man-apes in the cave above. The leopard gave a snarl of fury as it realized that it had lost the element of surprise, but it did not check its advance, for it knew that it had nothing to fear. It reached the ledge and rested for a moment on the narrow open space. The scent of blood was all around, filling its fierce and tiny mind with one overwhelming desire. Without hesitation, it padded silently into the cave. And here, it made its first error. For as it moved out of the moonlight, even its superbly night-adapted eyes were at a momentary disadvantage. The man-apes could see it, partly silhouetted against the opening of the cave, more clearly than it could see them. They were terrified, but they were no longer utterly helpless. Snarling and lashing its tail in arrogant confidence, the leopard advanced in search of the tender food that it craved. Had it met its prey in the open, it would have had no problems, but now that the man-apes were trapped, desperation had given them the courage to attempt the impossible, and for the first time, they had the means to achieve it. The leopard knew that something was wrong when it felt a stunning blow on its head. It lashed out with its forepaw and heard a shriek of agony as its claws slashed through soft flesh. Then there was a piercing pain as something sharp drove into its flanks once, twice, and yet a third time. It whirled around to strike at the shadows, screaming and dancing on all sides. Again there was a violent blow as something caught it across the snout. Its teeth snapped on a white, moving blur, only to grit uselessly upon death bone. And now... In a final, unbelievable indignity, its tail was being dragged out by the roots. It whirled around, throwing its insanely daring tormentor against the wall of the cave. Yet whatever it did, it could not escape the rain of blows inflicted on it by crude weapons wielded by clumsy but powerful hands. 
Its snarls ran the gamut from pain to alarm, from alarm to outright terror. The implacable hunter was now the victim and was desperately trying to retreat. And then it made its second mistake, for in its surprise and fright it had forgotten where it was. Or perhaps it had been dazed or blinded by the blows rained on its head. Whatever the case, it bolted abruptly from the cave. There was a horrible screech as it went toppling out into space. Ages later, it seemed, there came a thud as it crashed into an outcropping halfway down the cliff. Thereafter, the only sound was the sliding of loose stones, which quickly died away into the night. For a long time, intoxicated by victory, Moon Watcher stood dancing and gibbering at the entrance of the cave. He rightly sensed that his whole world had changed and that he was no longer a powerless victim of the forces around him. Then he went back into the cave and, for the first time in his life, had an unbroken night's sleep. In the morning, they found the body of the leopard at the foot of the cliff. Even in death, it was some time before anyone dared to approach the vanquished monster. But presently, they closed in upon it with their bone knives and saws. It was very hard work, and they did no hunting that day. Chapter 5 Encounter in the Dawn As he led the tribe down to the river in the dim light of dawn, Moon Watcher paused uncertainly at a familiar spot. Something he knew was missing, but what it was he could not remember. He wasted no mental effort on the problem, for this morning he had more important matters on his mind. Like thunder and lightning and clouds and eclipses, the great block of crystal had departed as mysteriously as it had come. Having vanished into the non-existent past, it never troubled Moon Watcher's thoughts again. He would never know what it had done to him, and none of his companions wondered, as they gathered round him in the morning mist, why he had paused for a moment here, on the way to the river. From their side of the stream, in the never-violated safety of their own territory, the others first saw a moon watcher and a dozen males of his tribe as a moving freeze against the dawn sky. At once they began to scream their daily challenge, but this time there was no answer. Steadily, purposefully, above all, Silently, Moon Watcher and his band descended the low hillock that overlooked the river, and as they approached, the others became suddenly quiet. Their ritual rage ebbed away to be replaced by a mounting fear. They were dimly aware that something had happened, and that this encounter was unlike all those that had ever gone before. The bone clubs and knives that Moon Watcher's group carried did not alarm them, for they did not understand their purpose. They only knew that their rivals' movements were now imbued with determination and with menace. The party stopped at the water's edge, and for a moment the others' courage revived. Led by one ear, they half-heartedly resumed their battle chant. It lasted only a few seconds before a vision of terror struck them dumb. Moon Watcher raised his arms high into the air, revealing the burden that until now had been concealed by the hirsute bodies of his companions. He was holding a stout branch, and impaled upon it was the bloody head of the leopard. The mouth had been jammed open with a stick, and the great fangs gleamed a ghastly white in the first rays of a rising sun. Most of the others were too paralyzed with fright to move, but some began a slow, stumbling retreat, that was all the encouragement that Moon Watcher needed. Still holding the mangled trophy above his head, he started to cross the stream. After a moment's hesitation, his companions splashed after him. When Moon Watcher reached the far side, one ear was still standing his ground. Perhaps he was too brave or too stupid to run. Perhaps he could not really believe that this outrage was actually happening. Coward or hero, it made no difference in the end as the frozen snarl of death came crashing down upon his uncomprehending head. 
shrieking with fright, the others scattered into the bush. But presently they would return, and soon they would forget their lost leader. For a few seconds, Moonwatcher stood uncertainly above his new victim, trying to grasp the strange and wonderful fact that the dead leopard could kill again. Now he was master of the world, and he was not quite sure what to do next. But he would think of something. Chapter 6 A Scent of Man A new animal was abroad on the planet, spreading slowly out from the African heartland. It was still so rare that a hasty census might have overlooked it among the teeming billions of creatures roving over land and sea. There was no evidence as yet that it would prosper or even survive on this world where so many mightier beasts had passed away. Its fate still wavered in the balance. In the hundred thousand years since the crystals had descended upon Africa, the man-apes had invented nothing. But they had started to change and had developed skills which no other animal possessed. Their bone clubs had increased their reach and multiplied their strength. They were no longer defenseless against the predators with whom they had to compete. The smaller carnivores they could drive away from their own kills, the larger ones they could at least discourage and sometimes put to flight. Their massive teeth were growing smaller, for they were no longer essential. The sharp-edged stones that could be used to dig out roots or to cut and saw through tough flesh or fiber had begun to replace them with immeasurable consequences. No longer were the man-apes faced with starvation when their teeth became damaged or worn. Even the crudest tools could add many years to their lives. And as their fangs diminished, the shape of their face started to alter. The snout receded, the massive jaw became more delicate, the mouth able to make more subtle sounds. Speech was still a million years away, but the first steps toward it had been taken. And then the world began to change. In four great waves, with two hundred thousand years between their crests, the ice ages swept by, leaving their mark on all the globe. Outside the tropics, the glaciers slew those who had prematurely left their ancestral home, and everywhere they winnowed out the creatures who could not adapt. When the ice had passed, so had much of the planet's early life, including the man-apes. But unlike so many others, they had left descendants. They had not merely become extinct, they had been transformed. The tool makers had been remade by their own tools. For in using clumps and flints, their hands had developed a dexterity found nowhere else in the animal kingdom, permitting them to make still better tools, which in turn had developed their limbs and brains yet further. It was an accelerating, cumulative process, and at its end was man. The first true men had tools and weapons only a little better than those of their ancestors a million years earlier, but they could use them with far greater skill and somewhere in the shadowy centuries that had gone before, they had invented the most essential tool of all, though it could be neither seen nor touched. They had learned to speak, and so had won their first great victory over time. Now, the knowledge of one generation could be handed on to the next, so that each age could profit from those that had gone before. Unlike the animals who knew only the present, man had acquired a past, and he was beginning to grope toward a future. He was also learning to harness the forces of nature. With the taming of fire, he had laid the foundations of technology and left his animal origins far behind. Stone gave way to bronze and then to iron. Hunting was succeeded by agriculture. The tribe grew into the village, the village into the town. Speech became eternal thanks to certain marks on stone and clay and papyrus. Presently, he invented philosophy and religion, and he peopled the sky, not altogether inaccurately, with cards. As his body became more and more defenseless, so his means of offense became steadily more frightful. With stone and bronze and iron and steel, he had run the gamut of everything that could pierce and slash and quite early in time he had learned how to strike down his victims from a distance. The spear, 
the pole, the gun, and finally the guided missile had given him weapons of infinite range and all but infinite power. Without those weapons, often though he had used them against himself, man would never have conquered his world. Into them he had put his heart and soul, and for ages they had served him well. But now, as long as they existed, he was living on borrowed time.